Welcome everybody to this uh, new uh, Product Tank Oakland uh, talk. Um, today we've got the pleasure to have Rich Mironov with us. Uh, Rich is a product leaders consultant, I will say, is helping uh, companies across the globe to improve their uh, product management practices in the enterprise space, especially. Uh, he's coming from Portland. Uh, he moved there uh, recently and we're very, very glad to have him here uh, today. A few um, information on how this uh, webinar is going to work. At the bottom of the, your screen, you've got two very important uh, buttons. The first one is the chat button. So anytime you want to react to uh, what you're listening or uh, share some information with the rest of the crew, um, just go to the chat panel, uh, select um, the message to all panelists and attendees so everyone can have access to whatever you're saying and, and share your, your perspective on what you're listening. The second very important button is the Q&A. Um, the Q&A enabled you to uh, ask a question to uh, Rich and at the end of the talk, we're going to spend 10 minutes to answer the question you're going to be able to upvote for the question you like the most. And at the end, we're just going to go through the priority orders. Uh, during this talk, um, there's going to be a poll and Rich is going to take some break in order to answer a few questions that we already have in the Q&A panel. So don't wait for the end of the talk to put your question there. And I think that's it. Thank you again, Rich, for joining us and the floor is yours. Great, thanks so much, and, and it's, uh, it's still Monday here. It's uh, early afternoon Monday in uh, the Western US. Uh, thanks for everybody getting up early, if you were getting up early. I know it's uh, around eight o'clock there uh, Tuesday morning. So I wanted to grab a talk of mine, uh, a recent one that really touches, I think, on the sort of servant leader essence of product management here, where we're trying to get things done and get the right things done without uh, getting stuck in sort of dogmatic, uh, very detailed uh, process descriptions, which might not fit. So we're gonna take an instance of that and take that apart as a way to talk about uh, good collaboration with our teams, good agile with a small a, and a few other thoughts along the way. So I'm going to share my slides here, if I did this right. Great. So um, anyway, no big surprise. Here we are, um, and and the you know the lead in here is my stories aren't long enough according to my development team, except when they're too long. So we're going to unpack that as a way to understand uh, different ways we can we can deal with our team and and get a lot more uh, emotional tie-in, not just doing tickets. Okay. So for those of you who don't know me, uh, I've been down to Auckland a bunch of times. Uh, hope to get there soon as things open up at both ends here. Uh, I've been doing the, the software product management dance since the 80s. For those of you who thought it was a new thing, not so much. Um, and these days, the, the work I'm doing mostly is I'm mentoring and coaching product leaders, uh, including uh, the whole PushPay team that I've been working with now for two and a half or three years and is one of the reasons I'm so connected to the Auckland uh, uh, product world down there. Um, and I do a lot of work around designing product organizations, how many people we need, how we're going to divide up the work. And that leads sometimes for me doing what we call the smoke jumper job, dropping into a company as the head of product or the VP of product for a quarter or two to straighten things out and then give the keys back to whoever we hire behind me to take over. Um, blogging, anybody who hasn't seen my blog, it's now uh, almost 19 years old. So I've been blogging once a month for a really long time been involved in the Agile world for a long time. And a lot of what we're gonna talk about here for the next uh, 40 or 50 minutes is trying to focus on outcomes or business results or what matters to our customers rather than uh, specific steps that we think we have to go through in order to have a process that we like. Okay, so framing that up, um, here's what I learned. Uh, and. I don't know if anybody's ever written this user story, but it seems sort of uh, embl emblematic of what we do, right? As a user, I want to do stuff. Um, and it's easy to confuse writing a JIRA ticket or creating a user story or jotting something down with real work. Um, it's really just a step along the way. So here's what one of my teams told me 
in no uncertain terms. What they said was, all of my user stories needed more detail, more context, clearer success metrics. I was not giving them enough. I wasn't providing enough of all the good things and leaving it up for them to do too much interpreting, right? And what's important here is the word all. Uh, we often experience, I think, that our development teams and many other folks will tend to generalize from one or two instances to all. And it's, easy to, it's easier to say everything you're doing is wrong or everything you do is too short than to get more specific. And no surprise here. But about three days later, we had a very funny discussion where the same team came back to me and said just the opposite. My stories are too prescriptive. We're focused on the how. I'm taking away all of their creativity. Um, I'm not framing the problem enough, right? So, you know, what, what's interesting about this is the word all in both cases, because clearly I'm not always doing the one or always doing the other. So something must be happening here that's more interesting, more subtle, more product management-y than just more, or more stories, shorter stories, longer stories, right? So we're going to unpack that a little bit and try to figure out what's happening. But before I dig into my development team here, I want to bring us back to some really core product management essentials that we usually think of with respect to customers or users or buyers or folks outside the company that we know, but maybe we're not applying uniformly within our company as well. So, so here's the first version of this. Um, I'm quoting myself here just so that I, I'm not the person quoted on the slide after this. I observe that most of the time when customers tell me they want something, first of all, they put it in solution terms. They say, do X, write a new report, you know, move this button around, change the format, um, you know, boot faster, whatever it is, rather than describing what's broken, right? And so that means that we're putting my product management hat on. I have to be able to unpack or back off from the thing they say they want especially because they almost always don't understand our architecture, our product goals, how things fit together. Um, most users don't understand the idea that if you add 50 more features to your product, your product gets harder to use, not easier. And so we may often want to be pairing things away, throwing away features that aren't being used rather than following our users explicit words by putting more and more and more features in. So again, I observe that, if we do just what customers say they want, we're probably doing the wrong thing. We have to actually figure out what the underlying problem or issue is and solve it for them. That's why we're product managers, right? But don't take my word for it. So here's Alex Osterwalder. Uh, he's, uh, for those who don't know, uh, he pioneered the business model canvas and a bunch of other canvases. I had the great pleasure to coach part of his product team in Toronto for a little while as they were trying to turn those concepts into software products, right? Customers are experts at what they want to achieve. Sure, what's your goal? You know, what's your problem? But they're not experts in how to achieve it. We want to be deeply suspicious and we want to do a lot of inspecting when someone tells me how to do, right? Okay, so that's from the customer side, right? So when we boil that down, here's our Band-Aid or whatever brand you've got uh, down there in Auckland. Um, Symptoms or root cause. Mostly we're getting problem descriptions or demands that are around symptoms. They're poorly framed. They're incorrect. They don't understand our, our underlying architectures. They often are superficial or just plain off base, right? And so again, I observe that if we as product managers just do what we're told, if we write down on post-it notes the things users say and we hand those over to our developers, we're getting a lot of waste, a lot of wrong answers, right? So we need to be doing better than simply writing down what somebody tells us, right? We need to understand it, get the context, unpack the issues, reframe it, share it with the team. And in particular, uh, I observe that almost everybody on my development team either is or believes that they're smarter than I am. And I'll give you 80%. Right, 80% of the folks on my team are way smarter than I am. And so if I'm gonna tell them what to do, I'm wasting all their good cycles, I'm wasting their, their emotions and their involvement and the chance to get a way better solution than simply doing what I told them, right? So I'm gonna tell you that 
if we're going to get to the root cause, we're really going to understand it and build the right things. We as product folks want to harness the whole team, developers, designers, uh, test automation stuff, DevOps, tech writers, whoever else is on your team. We want to get everybody's brain in the room on the interesting problems. So we as a group can figure out what the solutions are rather than just have some product manager jot them down and tell them what to do. Again, this would seem obvious, but apparently it's not. Um, one of the things I learn almost every day as a consultant is that the things I think are obvious aren't obvious. <laughs> so, but we're going to come back a little bit here and let's anchor ourselves. We're going to get in the way back machine and go back to 2001 to the very, very first part of the Agile Manifesto. Anybody who hasn't been there should probably read it. Um, and this is a group of folks who I was not involved with. By the way, there wasn't a product manager or a product person in the group. It was almost all systems architects and engineers and VPs of engineering. But here's the very first point they make. Um, they want us to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. In other words, if the tools don't help us, if the processes don't get us to good answers, we want to listen to the people. We want to watch the way we interact. We want to listen to our customers and our partners. Not that processes and tools are bad, but in general, they're not enough, right? There is no perfect, generalized, universal best practice that's going to lead us anywhere in the product management game, right? So I'm going to pull us back here a few times to this same point because I think it's really important rather than the scrum by the book model that says, you know, I picked up a scrum book and I'm doing exactly what the book says and somehow it's not helping me. Right. Um, sometimes we call that the cargo cult theory. We're following the steps, but we don't know why they're important. And so they don't take us anywhere. Okay. Take, take a deep breath. Um, because this takes me to my markers for good, strong, agile organizations. I guess if I were really clever, I would have taken that A in agile and made it a lower case. Cause what I'm really thinking about here is the basic philosophy of thinking for ourselves. Right. And so here's a few things I'm always looking for. Again, sometimes I drop into companies to head the product organization or I'm coaching the head of product or I'm doing some kind of assessment about what's working and not working. Um, I'm going to tell you, I don't care about, for instance, Kanban versus Scrum. Sometimes Kanban's a better choice. Sometimes Scrum's a better choice. Sometimes neither of those are something completely different. Right. We want to lean much more on the Google promoted idea of psychological safety. How do we do the right things and how do we figure out the right things? So very first marker here, I expect and I demand that if we're going to get good software built, we're going to have stable whole teams and a whole team is one where you don't borrow folks for every new project or week. You don't have them lined up, for instance, all the front end engineers in one team and all the back end engineers in another team. Cause what that means is every time you want to get work done, you're pulling people from different teams. And I really, really want those teams tied to some tangible portion of customer value. Uh, if it's a small product, maybe the team owns the whole product. If it's a big product, maybe your team owns, I don't know, authentication and security, or in the e-commerce space, maybe uh, putting things into the basket for sale later. Or if you're in the ERP system, you might have a whole set of things to predict demand for uh, parts in your system. But there should be a clear set of customer value tied to the team. That's going to be really important as we try to figure out who to talk to to see what's important. Right? If we're taking project work off the stack at random and creating new groups where every time we do a new group, we're going to have to go through the same storming, norming dash of figuring out how we're going to work together and relearning all the things we need to do. So notice this is almost not about product yet. This is about engineering, but I don't see product managers succeeding if we have a chaotic engineering or development organization where folks don't work on things very long. They don't own their own bugs. They don't develop expertise and taste. Okay. So second one, I'm going to tell you that in my organizations, it's always, always true that the product manager and the rest of the team are going to listen to, learn from, tap into, interview end users. And by the way, end users here are the folks who really tap on uh, mobile devices or keyboards or something else to use our stuff. Um, 
end users are not your sales team and users are not your marketing team or your support team. They're certainly not your distributors. And often in the enterprise, we see a big distinction between the folks who buy. So that's some senior vice president in charge of some big organization at your customer who signs purchase orders and gets taken out for drinks by your sales team and the real end users who pound on the keys. So in a bank, you might find some SVP of information technology who signs purchase orders, but the folks who work in your branches or who answer calls over the phone or who have to do due diligence on loans are the real end users. So we'll come back to this a few more times, but if we as product managers aren't talking directly with our end users, then we're getting almost everything we learn, secondhand, thirdhand, fourthhand. We're reading notes in Salesforce and hoping our sales team knows something. Right, And if we're not bringing our whole team into those meetings or at least rotating it through, then they're getting it secondhand from us and we're missing the chance to have a really strong emotional connection between the real folks who use our stuff and the real folks who build it. Okay, let's keep going. Um, as I said, I expect my whole team to work on defining problems as well as defining solutions. We don't do this with everything. Clearly, if we have a wrong error message because it's spelled wrong, we don't need to get a two-hour meeting with 15 people to talk about that. But there's going to be a series of interesting, meaty, challenging problems where we as product managers may not get the right answer. We certainly don't have all the right perspective. And we're going to want to pull our whole team in or the relevant folks so that um, we get a better answer and we have buy-in and we don't trip over ourselves so much. Okay, let's keep going. There's a few more here. Um, all right, automated test suite. This is explicitly not a product management problem per se, but if you're working at a company that's doing manual testing, you're throwing money away every time you do that and it's slow and it's wrong and it's incomplete and manual testing never does a good consistent job. And it also probably is slowing down your release cycle by weeks or maybe even months. So I'm always looking to have an automated test suite. If it isn't there, I'm pushing the engineering team to build it and the rest of the company to give us the slack and the money to get that done. Because once we've got an automated test suite and, and the, the gold the standard here is that any one member of your development team could check in one line of code, hit a button, run the whole automated test suite and see if anything broke, right? It's not new. I, uh, I had the great honor of doing some automated test suite stuff at Sybase in 1993, 1994, 1995. So that's, you know, 25 years ago, folks have been doing automated test suites. Um, so any excuse that it's new or it's not ready yet or it's too expensive, I think is, is not very well thought out. Okay, let's keep going. Um, objectives, right? When we have objectives for our team, the objective is not to ship a feature on a particular date although that's nice. The objective is to find something that's gonna cause our end users to be happier or use our system more often or make fewer errors or sign up for more volume. Behavioral changes on the part of our end users or if it's some application that's for internal use on our internal users is what our objective should be, right? It's fine to be fast, but shipping the wrong things fast doesn't matter. Okay, it looks like I'm just gonna check in that Sally Law may have had a question she wanted to ask. So let's take, I'll take a breath and um, Anthony or David, if there's an interesting question, go. Yeah, there, there is a question from uh, Lawrence Brock. Uh, any recommended test, test suite? Um, I, I don't know, I don't care. Um, there, there are lots of folks who have very, very strong opinions about which test automation product is better. Um, I look to my engineering team. If, if they pick it and they're happy, then I'm happy as long as we're using it, as long as it runs, as long as it's something that's going to drive, you know, persistent improvements in quality. I ask much more about, for instance, coverage. You know, if we've got a 15% coverage of our code, then no matter what automated test tool we're using, it's deeply insufficient. You know, you should be up in the 70s, maybe even to 80s, so that you're not shipping stuff that's broken. Uh, it saves time, it saves money, it saves customer upset. Um, I think there's no excuse. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, and, and, and so, sorry, Richard, just, just a ahead, message, for, message for Sally. If you did have a question, um, just drop it into the Q&A and we can, uh, we can get that answered. Um, if, there's, if, there's, if you've got a problem, just drop something into the chat. 
to either myself or David and we'll sort you out. That's right. And, and um, I, I've asked uh, David and Anthony to break in with interesting questions as we get there. Good. Okay. Frequent. Pro- sorry. For you, Rich. Um, for the first point, um, you talk about uh, stability of the team and I completely agree with that it's so, so important. How do you uh, balance this uh, need for stability in a fast growing uh, organization? Uh, well, a good question. And that's hard. Um, in a in an organization that's not growing very fast, it's not much of a challenge. But you know, if you're going to add fifty percent to your engineering or development team in the next year, you're going to be pulling folks out of the teams you have to form new teams. Um, I'd be thinking about a balance here between um, trying to keep two or three or four stable members of a team f- for the full year, so that they're in a position to train and onboard the new hires. Um, I wouldn't blow up whole teams and scatter them to the wind. Um, a lot of this also, though, has to do with uh, system architecture or software architecture. So as you're adding new teams, you're, in fact, splitting their responsibilities. Uh, when you've got a very small company with one team, that team is responsible for all the software you're building. When you add a second team, you're going to split that roughly in half, and each team is going to be responsible for a deeper portion of let's say half the company's stuff. So as you grow teams, you actually have to go through a thoughtful uh, sort of software architecture division of labor or a product division of labor. So the new teams aren't creating even more dependencies than they should have, right? A, a good measure here is that, you know, 80 to 90% of each uh, set of work for the team should be able to be done within that team. If you've got lots of cross dependencies, you probably, Uh, allocated this wrong. Okay, so six, frequent process retrospectives and experiments. Notice I'm highlighting here not the retrospectives of the code or the product. I'm I'm highlighting the retrospectives of how we do our work. So, and we'll come back to in a sec around these user stories, but I always try to ask my teams in the retrospective for one suggestion that we could try to do something different next week for how product works with development or how we interview customers or where we store the things we're doing or the way we mark tickets or whatever, right? To find some thing every week or two that we can do that tunes up our process. Notice, and this is maybe the most important thing. Yes, Ginger, by the way, I've uploaded the PDFs of the slides and we'll share those out. Um, Notice that if you're doing Scrum exactly the way the Scrum book says and no variations on that, this makes no sense because you have some odd belief that there's a perfect platonic universal way of doing Agile that everybody's going to do the same. I've never found that to be true. As we do this item number six, we diverge from every other team that's doing some other version of Agile in some good ways, right? We're going to create our own internal agreement about how we get stuff done. And so that sort of flies in the face of, you know, some company with 500 teams saying that every team must follow exactly all of the processes they have, because that's just not a good fit. That's just not efficient, right? So um, this is why we're going to experiment with lots of things. We're going to throw back the ones we don't like. We're going to try not to invest too highly in things till we see they work. But every team's going to have some variation on this. So don't be afraid of having your team write some of its own rules. Be excited about that because that means we care and that means we're tuning and that means we're really getting good stuff done. Okay, last, maybe most important, if your team doesn't trust you, you might as well pack up your kit and go home. If you don't trust your team, you better figure out why. Um, Software is a team sport. Right? It's not an individual sport, and we need to bring the hearts and minds of our teams along, not just their obedience. So if this becomes a power play, if there's a lot of name calling, uh, I think it's our job to figure out what's not working here. Why are we getting this effect? Who's unhappy? How do we get more participation? How do we trust in each other and not just in the tickets we write? By the way, uh, anybody who thinks that product management is synonymous with writing JIRA tickets is missing most of the interesting stuff. Okay, so this is a pretty high bar. This is hard. And most of the teams I work with, whether they call themselves agile or not, 
fail on three, four, five, maybe even all seven of these. And that's okay if you're doing something about it. But if you're sitting, you know, in a corner unhappy, saying you're agile and you're not doing this stuff, then I'm not really sure what you're up to. Okay, let's get one more outside point of view. John Cutler, who I love, and, and uh, I think he actually came down there for the product day in Auckland, didn't he? Um, virtually. Uh, John and I have never met. I follow his stuff very actively. I think he's quite brilliant. And I just love the fact that he channels the inner emotional value of great teams. So you can read it for yourself, but you know, we talk about what doesn't work. We try not to assign personal blame, but we identify things and we fix them. And his phrase of success theater is where you don't make it any better, but you celebrate, right? We don't want to bother. We want to get with our teams and figure out how to tune our processes and our interactions so we get more and better stuff done. Okay, so I think we're almost ready to come back to our original story. Um, which was about user stories. Um, again, if I go back in the history file, Ron Jeffries was the guy who coined the phrase user story. He was one of those guys up in the mountains in Colorado for the uh, Agile Manifesto. And here were his three C's, a card or a post-it note or something, which almost always originally was taped to a wall or stuck to a wall someplace. And it's just so that we have something to hold onto. Now these have been converted in a lot of places to JIRA tickets but it doesn't actually matter to me what format they're in, what language they're in, what shape they're in, right? As long as we're gonna have something we can refer to, and then we're gonna talk about it. Um, it's not important necessarily that every single bit of detail goes into the user story. If my team and I understand a lot of good stuff, then maybe we don't need to write it down. And we'll see in a moment that that's gonna be an essential distinction here. We don't have to treat this as a legal document. It's not your last will and testament, right? And then we're gonna ask, we're gonna look for some confirmation that we understand it, right? And at the end of it, we're gonna look for some confirmation that we've met our goal. Does it cause users to be happier? Does it cause us to get fewer tech support calls? Does it load faster? Does it drive more users to sign up and pay for the uh, spendy and expensive version of our product instead of the basic one, right? So those are the things that are important. Not whether we call it a user story, not whether we have the right grammar. You know, as a, we all know it starts with as a, but we could skip that if my team lets me, right? Don't care about where it lives. Don't care whether it's Kanban or Scrum if we're getting good work done. Okay, so back to my team, because I kept talking about this team, but I didn't really give you the, the backstory. So we sat down, we did a retrospective, because remember, half the time they tell me that all my stories are too long, and half the time they tell me that all my stories are too short. And here I am, the uneducated, benighted, sort of dumb product manager trying to figure out what to do. So we did a retrospective, and, and the way we did this was we printed out on little pieces of paper. In fact, we, we loaded the printer up with index cards and we printed out the last 30 or 40 stories because I knew that there was something more subtle happening here and that when we talk in generalities, it's hard to find them. So I led the team through an exercise that looks like this, right? Which stories are too long and why? So we took those 30 or 40 stories and I had the folks lean in and pick out the specific stories which they felt were, were too long, were too complicated, right? And we looked for something that was common across that. And likewise, we looked for the stories that were too short, right? So rather than universally deciding it was one or the other, we piled them up. In fact, we had a pile of ones that they thought were too short and a pile of ones we thought were too long and some in the middle that were just right. I guess the, those were the Goldilocks stories, right? And, and we looked for what was it about them that caused them to be either too long or too short, right? So we're digging in, we're looking for root causes. We're not taking the superficial answer, right? And here's what we learned, and it may be obvious on inspection, but we didn't really know. We figured out that there's different kinds of stories. And some of the stories need different kinds of artifacts or different kinds of data or different kinds of inputs. And by piling these up in groups, by looking at them individually and then and finding the ones that are similar, we're able to see different classes of stories and treat them differently. So here's our list, right? Stories, likely artifacts, right? 
So first one, um, there were a bunch of stories that were very UX heavy. We were making changes to some workflows. Um, you know, the, the way you got from screen A to screen B to screen C was going to be different. And these were complicated. There were a lot of side cases. There were art issues. There were language issues. And so what the team told me was, first of all, we had some behavioral goals for these, right? We wanted the users to get through faster with fewer errors. And the team really wanted to know what those behavioral goals were. Did we have storyboards? Did we have journey maps? What about the, the not happy pads? What about user testing? Notice this smacks a lot of design artifacts. And as a product manager who's sort of design blind, these weren't going to be my artifacts, but I knew we needed them, right? So my team told me that when we're doing a lot of UX UI work, we're going to need some specific stuff to make sure we are getting it right. Okay, let's do some con contrast. Performance, scalability, infrastructure. Um, in a different instance, by the way, at a, at a company in uh, Alameda, just across from San Francisco, I, I worked with a team for about six months, and uh, they were doing some real-time embedded systems that live in braking systems for high-end cars. So Mercedes was buying their microcode to boot up the brakes on the Mercedes when you turn the key in the car. And it turned out that... Uh, Startup time was really important. Performance was really important. Scalability was really important. And so the team looked to me and said, oh, Rich, you want us to have the boot time on this microchip with our stuff to be three times faster. And I said, yes, that's exactly what I want because that's what they need. And they said, please write all the stories. And this is where I admitted to not being a software architect and not knowing how to make our stuff faster. And they, they laughed at all the stories I wrote because I wasn't the right one. So for internal metrics, for technical hypotheses, I actually gave back to the team all the story writing. We tapped a couple of senior architects on the shoulder and said, you, you folks write the story for how we're going to improve performance and scalability. Because in this case, having Rich write it as the less educated product manager was of very little use, right? So when this was internal, not much user facing, we understand the goals. We... Um, you know, I, I kicked the story writing over to them and that was just fine because they were gonna rewrite my story anyway. Good, let's keep going. All right, lightweight bug fixes, right? Do we need 500 words and acceptance criteria and all this stuff for lightweight bug fixes? Not so much, hang on just a moment. Great, so what we need for lightweight bug fixes is probably just how to do the reproduction, right? So give us the steps when I you know, when I hit the enter key on your application and it blue screens or it falls over, well, let's reproduce the steps, right? So we don't need to frame it. We don't need behavioral goals, right? Just fix the effing thing. So again, what we're identifying here is that one group of user stories probably doesn't uniformly do what we need. Um, just give us the trouble tickets or the, the support person to walk us through. We'll figure out why it's broken. And it's probably not that hard. Right, so let's move on. Um, next one, validation, experiments, research. So here's much more of the classic early stage product management work. We wanna put up a button and see if people are gonna click it. We wanna create a new report to see if folks are gonna use it. We're gonna add new colors or pricing or something. And it's an experiment, it's validation, which means first of all, we wanna spend as little effort on the engineering and development side as possible. And then we wanna make sure we've instrumented it and we know what success looks like. And we wanna make sure our developers aren't feeling like we're wasting their time because sometimes they feel like experiments aren't real work when we know they are. So for the experiments, we're gonna to try to be a little more deliberate. We're gonna make sure we've written down our learning goals. We're clear with the team that we want as little code as possible, maybe no code, right? We wanna test the assumptions and we wanna remind them that we don't need to gold plate this. We don't need to have it be perfect. We don't need to have it be through every hoop and hurdle because we're probably gonna throw it away next week, right? So the more context we can provide to the team about why we're doing this experiment or validation and what we hope to learn, the more likely we are to get a good answer from someone in the room who can show us how to test this out, maybe with no code at all, right? Because Odds are 80%, we're gonna throw it away when we're done. Okay, take a deep breath. Refactoring, tech debt. 
Now, I know that as a product manager, I have to spend a lot of my time fighting with the rest of the company in order to um, make sure that engineering has permission to actually retire some tech debt, to refactor things that are bad, that they've got the budget and time to do this. But it's not clear how invested I am in any one piece of tech debt or any one piece of refactoring. And what this particular team and I put together was that I was going to be in charge of making sure there was a budget, and let's call that 200 story points a month or whatever it is, right? But that I was actually going to let the team do the first pass on picking what we're going to work on. So as long as they pick something that was going to, in their view, deliver better throughput for development and better joy for development and fewer bugs and, and more happiness, I was going to take whichever choice they made as long as it fit in the budget. So they didn't need much detail at all. In fact, I needed the detail because in order to explain it to other folks, I should probably understand it myself. And many of these things were invisible to the rest of the world, at least in the short term, because we were fixing ugly things in the back that we were tripping over every week. Right? So again, this became a budget exercise, less detail, maybe no detail. And then last one, an interesting one that I wasn't really expecting. Sometimes we're working on artwork or branding that's all about how the company wants to be seen to the outside world. We have a new logo. We're changing the, the type font that we use. We have particular language, right? And there's an outside audience for this. In general, the artwork and the branding stuff comes not from product management, but from marketing right? And it's a lot of design. And the marketing folks would always throw it back if we didn't get the logo exactly right in the right place. So on the occasion we were doing artwork branding work, what we really needed was down to the pixel. And maybe that was our designer and maybe that was somebody else in the company who's a designer, but we might as well get this exactly right, the exact specs, because we're going to have to keep doing it until we get it right. Okay, I'm going to take a breath here because this is, this is the meat of the talk and there may be some questions. Um, also, Rich, do we want to maybe launch the poll just to get an idea from our audience sure. about who, write, who writes stories in their organization? Good. perfect so we, time. So for every, everyone, you'll, you'll have a poll that will pop up in just a second where um, you'll have the opportunity to tell us who writes the stories in your organization and you can select more than one option. So I'll launch that now. And with a little luck, you should now be able to vote. And we'll, um, I'll, as well, after we've gone through the questions, we'll come back to everybody with the results. Perfect. All right. So we've got a, got a few questions here. The, the, the most popular one by far is from um, Tokes down in Wellington. Um, how should teams balance time spent on problems versus solutions? E.g., will the product manager spend more time on problems and developments, more time on solutions? What's the right balance to avoid everyone um, crystal gazing when we also need to build stuff? Uh, really good question. And of course, the obvious answer that all product managers give all the time is it depends. <laughs> um, I, I, would, I would force that into the retrospective way of asking the question, which is, we're allocating some time today to thinking and problem identification and some amount of time to solutioning. Um, does it feel right? Should we in the next week or month spend a little more time on the problem side or maybe a little more time on the solution and building side? Um, I have no way of knowing what the right mix is here. And it depends a lot on your problem and your mix and your understanding and how long the team's been together and lots of other things. But the, the essential item here is to ask the right question. Is it working? Should we adjust? If we adjust it a little bit more toward more time toward problems, how do we think that's going to work? How do we know we're happier? Right? Do that for a week, do that for two weeks, get everybody back together again and ask if we feel like we've made progress. Okay. I see that, that uh, we've got the poll up. Um, any other questions before we come back to polls? Uh, maybe, maybe uh, oh, actually one, one, one here from, um, from Priya. Um, most organizations Thanks, Priya. Have, a, have a discovery team and a delivery team, which prevent the whole team from working on the problems together. Um, this is coming from the mindset that the development team is just there to, to write code. Um, what could work for the product team to engage with development and convince management about bringing those two groups together? Yeah, I would, by the way, I would do that in that order. So I think having a development team that just executes, that just does what we tell them is a huge waste of almost everything. 
time, emotion, joy, good code, participation. I think we find that, that uh, folks walk away, they quit companies if they're developers and they don't really get an internal sense of why their, their users care. Um, everywhere I go, I see that when we bring members of the development and design team into our interviews, they both get insights that we missed and they get emotionally charged up because they finally understand who our users are and why anybody cares. Um, but I, I find that going to the executive team and claiming some future benefit about doing this, um, they're not interested. They don't care, right? So what I would do is I would pick a couple of problems that I think are interesting ones for the team. I'd pull them together. We would experiment with this. Let's call it an experiment so we don't need permission, right? And, you know, let's run it the other way on a few problems. And if it turns out that we see more participation, we see more enthusiasm, we see better solutions, we get interesting ideas, then we'll have proven to ourselves that it's better you might or might not go up to your management team and tell them anything. Kind of depends on, on where they're coming from. But if our team's building better stuff and is happier, I'm not sure I need any other permission than that. Okay, let, let's, let's jump onto the poll. So interesting. Um, perhaps, so uh, let me just hit the end button and I think that will share. If I get out of sharing, again. I think we can see yours, right? Yep, hopefully everyone can see the okay, results now. On. So. Um, so not, not surprising there. So product owner, 74%, um, engineers and product or BAs coming in second place by the looks of things and then product managers and sort of everyone else. So that, that's interesting. It's an interesting balance there between product and engineering, which is, I think that's, I think that's healthy by the looks of things. Rich, what do you think? I, I like that a lot. And, and you know, I've spoken and written endlessly about product owner versus product manager. I don't care what we call ourselves. It, it really matters what we do. So if the folks writing stories are well-informed, if the folks writing stories understand the real need, you know, for user-facing stuff that they've actually talked directly to the folks with the problem in enough numbers that we understand what's really broken, um, if it's an internal thing, then maybe the folks writing the story are the experts. If they're not, they should be talking to the folks who really care. Um, so, so I like this. I think this is a good mix. I'd be unhappy if it were just the first two uh, rows. On this topic, uh, there is a question in the Q&A from Priya, uh -huh. which is, what are your thoughts on the product manager and product owner rules? But I assume that um, in Priya's mind is that um, in many companies, we've got both rules. We've got the product owners yeah. is internal focus with the team and the product manager that is external focus thinking about the customer and strategy. Right. What are that's a, about yeah, that's a model. That's a model I hate. And, and in a huge organization, maybe you need it. But when I parachute into a company to take over the product team, one of the very first things I do is, is I figure out that everybody who's good is going to stay in that team and we're going to, we're probably going to promote all the product owners to be product managers just because that seems like a more interesting title. Anybody who doesn't want to do the end to end work of both talking directly to the real people who use our stuff and dealing directly with their development team, in my view, doesn't get to stay on my team. Mm -hmm. So, so I like to blow up that whole distinction. I think it's an artifact of, bad understanding and really big organizations that don't build software for a living. I know if you're in a bank or an airline, that may be how you're doing it. Um, when I look at companies that build software as their product and who go out of business if they don't build good software, um, I don't see them creating both of those roles. I see one person who is responsible entirely for that team for both understanding the need, interacting with the real users and customers, and getting the right uh, stories written. So in the same way that I don't want to see, you know, somebody, um, hmm. who, who was it that said Ginger called out, nobody needs coding monkeys, right? I think if, if you're really just writing user stories and accepting user stories, we're wasting most of your talent. And that just seems, that makes me unhappy. Hmm. Yeah, one way okay. I, I'm dealing with this is to change the language actually. And I well, start talking about yeah. product management and product owners, start talking about product tiers people in the product um, space. Sure. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, if you get paid more for being a product owner than a product manager, take the money and vice versa. But um, this whole distinction is one that I think is, is created by folks who don't really care about or understand how good stuff is built. Um, the, the fewer hops between really understanding the problem and really understanding the solution is how we get good stuff built. And if you're two in a box where one of you only talks with customers and one of you only talks with developers, uh, I feel like you're, you're wasting you know, more than half of your energy. All right, we're gonna come back to the last bits of slide where here, hang on, let's share. Okay, good. So um, hopefully you're back on this. So let's- uh, Yeah, it's good. Good, okay. So just a couple more. Um, so, I, so I created some post-it notes because of course these might be post-it notes as a sort of wrap up before we get to the, to the question and answer, right? So if it's a bug, and this is what my team and I decided, of course your team and you will make completely different choices. And what's important isn't what I think, it's what you and your team decide after you sit down and you work out how to be happier and get more done, right? So if we had a bug like this data retrieval bug, right, here's how it works. Somebody enters a bad date, they leave the account number blank, they hit update and you get a 404. Okay, that's enough for somebody to reproduce the bug, to chase it through, to figure out why it's happening, right? Good, all right, how about one that looks completely different? Here's my boot up off the chip 4X faster. And we're gonna have a series of architect-led performance ideas. Notice the product manager is not gonna write them and think of it like a do loop in the old programming sense. Until we get it fast enough, the team's gonna pick something and prototype it and see if it works. If it does work, we're gonna finish it and move it into production. If it doesn't work, we're gonna pick another one. And we're gonna keep doing that, do until either we hit our performance goal or we run out of good ideas, right? So notice this is almost a nested, this may be an epic or a nested user story. Um, and as a product manager, that's enough for me. If my team can do this and I just bring the pizza and the t-shirts and the applause, then I'm really very happy because I turn out to be the last person on the planet who's gonna know how, in this case, to improve the performance, right? And then uh, a concierge validation test. A concierge test here is where uh, we actually have a person behind the software who's doing the job. So we don't automate it at all. We just sort of put a little drape in front and so uh, in one instance of a concierge test, um, this was for a financial services product that manages your retirement portfolio. And we added a button and the button said, rebalance your portfolio. And when you hit the button, instead of actually doing the work, it popped up a message that says, we'll do it tonight. And it routed that request to somebody who actually knew how to rebalance the portfolio. Because what we were testing was not whether we knew how to do it, we were trying to test whether users were interested. And we went in with a threshold that said, we're gonna run it for two weeks. If a half percent of our users or more um, say they want this function, then we're gonna move it forward. If less than a half a percent don't, we're gonna don't use it, we're gonna drop it. So we wanted to spend the absolute least amount of design and development time to find out what our users thought. And for the 20 or 30 instances of this, it was perfectly reasonable to route it to a human over in the ops group who would do the stuff by hand, and who knew how to do the stuff by hand, and we could get a read on this. So again, notice that these are three kinds of user stories of, of which there are many, different evidence, different style of writing, different content, different interest, right? And so, th so it's not that we have to make them all longer, it's not that we have to make them all shorter, it's that we need to think about what's the right answer for our stuff. Okay, so a quick wrap up and then we'll take some more questions, right? I believe there's no universal agile process. There's no best practice. There's no just, just do it this way. And that your tools encourage you to think about this in a very mechanical way. Don't. Think about it in a human way. Think about what we're accomplishing. Um, dig deep. Everybody's gonna give you some very skinny, superficial, silly explanations for what they want you to do. Most of them are wrong. Most of them don't matter. Most of them will not move the needle or cause your KPIs to change or deliver money to your company. Be skeptical and dig, right? Um, so that's why do what I tell you, right? If we just do what our users tell us, I think we're wasting half of our team's time and all of their love and enthusiasm and involvement. 
you know, when we have a just do what I tell you team, I expect all the smart folks to quit eventually. Okay. Um, focus on outcomes, focus on real concrete value. Of course, your team worries about velocity, but from a product side, I don't care about velocity. I really don't. I care about whether we're shipping things that our users take advantage of that add, you know, dollars or improved KPIs or reduced uh, tech support load to my product. I care about the outcome. And if it takes a week longer, it takes a week longer. And if it gets done faster, then we get to celebrate. But velocity by itself is not a measure of product value. It's only a measure of, of whether my engineers are working hard. And I'd rather have them not work so hard, but get more interesting stuff done. Okay. And then you know, back to Agile basics, and this isn't product management particularly, but we all know teams that are doing too much stuff. How do we reduce the work in process? How do we finish what we say we're going to start? Because it turns out you actually get more work done in total if you start fewer things because there's fewer interrupts, there's more focus, there's more attention. Building software is really hard. And so when we overload our teams, we get less total through and we lose lots of things, we get confused, right? So, um, and then last, and I said it over and over again, I want my whole team involved. I want my whole team in the retrospectives. I want my whole team understanding the experiments. I want them to bring their hearts and souls to the office, not just their SQL coding skills. Okay, so uh, again, the, the PDF is, is uploaded and uh, David and Ant will, will pass that out later. So you don't have to worry about taking all this stuff down. Here's me. And, and one of my office managers, in case you haven't met um, Celeste, uh, and that's how to find me. So I am going to get out of share mode here so you can see my smiling face again. And then we've got uh, six minutes, so fire when ready. All right, well, so the most popular question at the moment is from Ginger. Um, any tips on how not getting, uh, sorry, so, so just, this is in the context of working remotely. Yep. Um, getting the team together and creating these stories when everyone's remote. Have you picked up anything over the past sort of weeks and months? Yeah, I, I think there, there's a lot of really good collaboration tools in there, out there. I, I think they're all roughly equivalent. Miro and Mural and, you know, Google Docs and, and Teams and choose your thing. I don't care. But I think the important thing is how we frame the questions, right? So rather than my shipping a solution around and having folks critique, I want to spend, you know, 20 minutes walking through what we think is not working, ideally with either some quotes from users or videos from users or, you know, how do we, how do we bring in the voice of the people who are stumbling? Because that's what gets us all charged up. And maybe there's an easy fix and maybe there's not. So, you know, before we go into solutioning, I would go around the virtual room and ask each person whether they felt like we had enough detail on the problem and they really understood it. I might even cold call a few and ask them to repeat back or, or synthesize the problem for us. And then let's write it down. You know, again, whatever we're in, let's write the problem statement at the top. So when we have five really good solutions, we can notice that none of them actually solve the problem that we wanted to solve. All right, next question from Richard, and I have a feeling this may, may have been contributed to by Saron. Um, how do you best involve design in the process, especially when we don't want to confine or define the length of their creative process? Well, I think we do want to define and confine the creative process because we have to get things done. But uh, I know that, that designers hear different things out of the very same conversation than product managers, than developers. So uh, when I'm scheduling interviews with users, I want a designer on the call with me. Now we have to have some ground rules about who asked the question because we can't have everybody jumping in. So maybe it's, you know, post-it notes or Slack messages about questions they'd like to answer. But I observe that designers are much more tuned to listening to issues about workflows and, you know, user problems and product managers are much more tuned to listen to economic arguments and developers are much more tuned to listen to data issues and throughput and where it lives in the cloud. So if I can get one designer and one developer sitting in on each of my interview calls and we rotate that through, then I think we're getting the good stuff directly. Um, now there are some design tests that are really long winded, like we're going to change our whole identity system. 
I'll kick that off in its own thing and stay out of its way. But when we're doing sort of product level work, um, you know, uh, often we have the design and the architecture happen in sprint one and the implementation happen in sprint two maybe, but, but it's the team doing it. It's not that I'm going to banish the designers out of the room until we've learned something. Which I think is coming to that there was sort of a, a follow up question there, which was um, or a follow up statement, which is around avoiding that situation where you have a mostly complete prototype that just kind of gets thrown over the fence to the team. I hate when that happens, and often, and and sometimes that'll happen because you have one team that's in charge of building prototypes, and another team that's in charge of building products. And the prototype team always confuses those things because they think it runs and so it's a product. But, but it hasn't been through all the rigor. It hasn't been through the architecture. It hasn't been through the testing. It doesn't fit the other workflows, right? There's a lot of things about that that are wrong. So when I see one team building the prototype and another team building the final product, I do my best to blow that whole organization up and move the prototypes in. Now that of course means we have to budget time and budget money for the team to build its own prototypes. But I think it's much more efficient and you get better results rather than having a separate team that does either discovery or prototypes. All right, and um, I, think, I think we may have covered this already, but maybe it might be a good way to kind of round off. There was a question from Ross earlier on in the session, which was saying, he's, he's, was a question slash statement, which was, could this not have been avoided by writing the stories in collaboration with members of the team? That way you have input from all the necessary functions and bring the risk to the front of the process. Um, mm, only sort of. So I think some of the stories that we write are completely straightforward and we don't need a meeting and we don't need nine people to have an opinion on. <laughs> so, so for those, I think that's not a good use of time. I, I would instead look down the list and say, which stories need the whole team's participation? And I'd look at the retrospectives for their opinions as to whether we chose correctly. So maybe over time we have more or fewer stories, right? But some of the stories need the whole team and some of them don't. And so the, the whole everybody does everything the same way always all the time, I think is, isn't, isn't as smart an approach as let's sit down and figure out what's effective for us. Perfect. I think that's a nice way to, nice way to round off the questions. I think Aaron, you had your hand up. Um, if there was something you'd like to know, just drop it into the chat or the Q and A. Um, and while that's happening, um, just wanted to, uh, huge give a huge thanks to rich for joining us um much appreciate jumping on especially just after you've moved moved places as well and moved cities it's my pleasure and you know a part of my heart lives in auckland even though my cardiologist isn't excited by that <laughs> well hopefully we'll see you back down here soon and, and also thanks very much to everyone who joined us i know um, everyone got up a little bit early on a chilly auckland morning to, to to jump on so thank you very much for that um, as Rich mentioned, um, we will make a link to the slides available shortly and we'll also have the recording published on our YouTube channel um, very soon as well, uh, once I get editing done this morning. Um, one announcement, um, so if you haven't already seen it, we are holding um, our second um, product unconference on Saturday, June the 20th, starting at 9am. Um, tickets are available through Eventbrite. Um, hopefully everyone who's a member of the session should have got um, an email with that link. Um, and it's also in our Slack channel as well. So, um, you know, do, do grab those tickets soon. It's the, the session is filling up and we do have limited space available. So um, please sign up for that um, as, as soon as you can. Um, it will be a virtual unconference. So obviously with the announcement of moving to level one, um, you know, the, the, we've decided to keep it virtual for now. Um, and also because it enables us to involve people from other cities as well. So that's going to be a really interesting session. Um, myself, David, and a bunch of others have put a whole lot of effort into understanding how we can replicate the experience, that the, the great experience we had at the Unconference last year virtually. So it's going to be really, really, really exciting. So get your tickets quickly for that. Um, and then just riffing on the, the idea of moving back to physical meetups, um, as, a, as an organizing team, we are talking about that. Um, hopefully towards the end of the month or um, early next month, we can actually have an event in person. It would be fantastic to see everybody's faces again and not just names in a Zoom session. Um, so I think that's all from me. David, did you have anything else you wanted to add there? 
few people uh, are keen to join the Slack channel, so we'll share the Slack channel address uh, with the slides uh, later on. Right, right. Perfect. Well, thanks for letting me join in, and, and I hope to be there in person sometime soon. Yes, and I'd say the last question there from Ross. Um, will the live events be recorded? I joined from the, joined from the UK and would hate to miss out now. Um, we are doing our best um, to record our in-person events. It actually, we, we did sort of, we're getting into the swing of that before lockdown and it turned out to be really valuable because we learned how to use Zoom to do remote events. So <laughs> it was a fortuitous timing. Um, so yeah, yes, Ross, as, mu as much as we can, we will record our live events. Cool. Thank All right. Everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a fantastic day. I see the sun has come out now. You can see it falling on my face. So get out there and enjoy a great day. And thanks so much, Rich, and enjoy your evening. All right. Take good care. Cheers. All right.